Nets win 5-4 to four against the New Jersey Devils in overtime and it's really hard to say that enthusiastically this time because it doesn't feel like we won. It's the strangest sensation. I know we won and I was super excited we won. I freaked out my cat when Vrana scores that overtime goal. She went running because I'm just like, yes, yes. But at the end of the day, it's like you don't have that super excitement of a great game because let's be honest, that was not a great game. Okay, well that's not true. It was a great 40 minutes. The first first two periods were just fantastic. It was like the Caps were just possessed. They were all over and they were taking it to the Devils. But then I don't know, maybe the Caps ran out of holy water or something like that because the third period, it was like the Devils were possessed. You ever seen that post on Facebook or maybe Instagram or Twitter that says, this team makes me drink and the word drink is in the font of the Capitals logo. Well, this game is what makes posts like that ring true. And the entire Caps fan base is feeling this way. You call on Caps Twitter right now and everybody agrees. No lead is safe for this Washington Capitals team. And guess what? I know why. Yes, that's right, folks. I have the answer. I can tell you for a definitive fact. Okay, it's not a fact. It's surely his opinion, but it feels like a fact why the Caps always give up a lead and why every game, no matter how big the lead is, comes down to a nail biter to the wire. We're gonna focus in on the third period in this video. The third period is what I want to talk about because that was obviously where you have either A, the Caps breaking down, or B, the Devils stepping up and truly playing their speed game that they know they can play well. Prime example, New Jersey's second goal, Jesper Bratt is just blazing from his own end to the offensive end, he dishes it over to Wood, and in the blink of an eye, it's in the back of the net. And that speed is deadly, and the reason the Caps keep giving up leads is because they back off on speed like that. They give up, that's the frank way of putting it. They give up playing, and this goal is the prime example. Let me show you why. Here's the shift chart from periods one and two, and here is the shift chart from period three. Look at those shifts for that second line for the Kuznetsov line. That is baffling. That is three very short shifts. Well, the first shift is actually pretty normal length. They're 45 seconds or so. The second and third shifts, what is going on there? That line played a total of one minute and 55 seconds in the entire third period. That comes down to, frankly, Peter Laviolette benched them. He benched them without like actually benching them. They played a little bit, but he put them on the bench and we need to know why. And to understand why the Caps keep giving up lead is to understand what is going on with this shift chart in the third period. Let's go back to New Jersey's second goal. Jesper Bratt streaking from his own end into the Caps end, dishes it off to Wood and scores. And the reason that that goal happens, the reason that Wood is wide open and there is no challenge for the puck for Brett streaking into the zone like that is because of a terrible shift change by this second line. Brett takes the puck from his own zone and comes flying through the neutral zone and look at Vrana and Kuznetsov. Look how lazily they get A, off the player with the puck and B, skate towards the bench. That is the most minimal effort you could possibly put into a line change and that is the reason that BBPL benched that line for the rest of the period. And what is so killer about this, what sucks about this, is that that was their first shift of that period. That means complacency, that means laziness, that means comfortableness, that means that that line saw that they were up four to one with 15 approximate minutes left in the game and they were like, yeah, we're good, we got this. No, that is why the Caps keep giving up leads, sometimes losing games because of it, and going to shootouts and overtimes because they keep getting lazy with the lead. Now, caveat to all this. Yes, that was extremely lazy by the second line, particularly by Kuznetsov and Vrana, but this is also, in my opinion, an instance of bad coaching on Peter Laviolette's part. Let me explain. Yes, there needs to be consequences or repercussions or whatever you want to call it for being lazy. And the right thing to do could be to bench that line because of lazy play or poor play or the leading to giving up a goal. However, that was the second goal. After benching that line, there's two more goals to be accounted for by New Jersey and it has nothing to do with the second line because they're benched. They can't be 
playing poorly or doing anything that leads to a bad goal because they are benched. But the catch 22 about the whole situation is that you just benched your fastest line against a young, fast team. You could argue that the fourth line is one of the faster lines because you have Carl Hagelin out there, but by far, leaps and bounds ahead of that is the second line. You have Vrana, who is definitely the fastest person on the team, and you have Daniel Sprong, who is maybe the second fastest person on the team. So you just benched your fastest line on the entire team against a super fast team, and guess what? That is what killed the Caps in this game. And hindsight, I know, is 2020. Looking back, it's easy to decipher the situation, but, but, Look at what happens in overtime. You have an extremely long extended shift for Ovi, Backstrom, and I think Carlson was the defenseman out there. They were out there for a majority of the overtime. The only time they weren't out there was when Vrana and Kuznetsov came on the ice for the line change, and what happened as soon as Vrana gets on the ice? Boom, it's a goal, game over. And he scores that goal using that speed. Now you could argue, you could say, that what Peter Laviolette did worked that it was the correct move because in the end, the Caps ended up winning the game. But what I say is that it should never have gotten to that point because even though you need to reprimand that line for poor play or a poor line change, you can't take away your most crucial weapon to defeating this team and leave it to the last minute and throw them out there and have them win the game. That just that's why we drink. It's just a super interesting situation. It's like I said earlier, it's a catch 22. You have to do something to discipline that line, but doing that is what hindered you the rest of the game. It, uh, what do you do in that situation as a coach? Ooh, I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions, but I mean, I guess if I was making millions of dollars a year, I could give it a good old college try, but I mean, that is some hard shit to worry about. So where do they go from here? Where, you just had this big moment where you have sat your second line for what they did, and then the second line comes out, well, majority of the second line comes out in overtime and scores the OT GWG. What do you do in practice, in video review, in personal conversations one-on-one? -on -one? What do you do now as Peter LaViolette to move past this, move on, and to learn from it and to get better from it? You have to have a frank conversation with them. That's about the only thing you can do. You have to show them, look, this led to a goal, this is why you were set, but also, Look what happens when you aren't lazy. Look what happens when you do move your feet, when you do put that effort into it. You get out there in overtime and boom, you score the goal. I'm not taking blame away from everyone else on the team. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to highlight the pivotal action that created a lot of chaos and a lot of, a lot of controversy in this game. The rest of the team played very, very well in the first 40 minutes and they did have hiccups, particularly the Orloff-Schultz pairing. I thought, despite Orloff scoring a very, very nice goal, I thought that pairing was pretty weak, to be frank. But the rest of the team is not blameless here. Everyone has to step up and, and learn from this situation and learn that you can be up five, six, seven goals. It doesn't matter. You let off the gas for just seven minutes in a period, and you're given a wide open window for that team to come back. And I said it last video, when you give this Devils teams an inch, they're gonna take a mile and then some, and that's what they did. They were given a fall, a small five to seven minute window of not challenging them, and that Devils team just ran with it, and they ran with it for the rest of the game. It wasn't just that seven minute window where they tied the game. They did it all the way up until the very last second. They got chance after chance. Vitek stood strong. He was able to make some fantastic saves, especially on the penalty kills late in the game. And then we go to overtime, and thank God, Vrana and Kuznetsov decided to finally step up and play the high speed, high effort game that they are very, very good at playing. It has to be a lesson, folks. It has to be a lesson, not just for these two, three guys, but for the entire team. This instance has to be put under the microscope and everyone has to see what happened, why it happened, what the result was, and what can be improved in the future to move past it and to get better from it. But what do I know? I'm just a fan. Hey, if you like this video, smash that thumbs up button for me. It goes a long way towards helping the channel. And if you enjoyed your time here, consider subscribing to the channel. I post a video after every game and would love to see you come back. And as always, let's go Caps!